Günaj Gür Kaynak, Anne Vid, Massimiliano Kadar. Very warm welcome to the Digital Markets Research Hub, a small corner on YouTube where we try to understand the mechanics of competition and the digital economy. And today, as uh, many of our listeners might imagine, we'll have a discussion on one of the most vibrant, one of the most important topic resonating with all competition law academics, policymakers, and practitioners. And our panel consists of three remarkable academics, policymakers, and practitioners. So we have a mixed cohort or very representative cohort, and we'll be discussing today the, the reform of the enforcement priorities of Article 102 of the TFEU. And uh, I propose we start our conversation with a kind of intellectual disclaimer, uh, articulating or highlighting or manifesting our normative understanding of the goals, because it was kind of a settled issue a decade ago. Now we are in a new juncture where everything is somehow has to be re-articulated. So maybe we start uh, for the benefits of all of us to very quickly summarizing our views on the goals of competition law in general and or the abuse of dominance in particular. Why don't we start with you, Ganesh? Thank you very much. So my approach on uh, the goals of competition law um, has been outlined in a book that I, I published in 2001. This was the prime objective of competition law from a law and economics perspective, the, the title of the book. Um, it was back in the day published by the Turkish Competition Authority, and uh, this was 22 years ago. Um, um, my my views have not changed particularly, but the, obviously I had to take on the challenge of how do I place sustainability in this uh, and how do I place um, other um, uh, goals of competition law as they are introduced. Uh, so the basics of my view was that um, welfare maximization, I was taking the view and I still am taking the view that it should be total welfare maximization. So social welfare maximization is the um, goal of uh, competition law. And to the extent uh, we want to follow a, a lead on consumer welfare maximization, um, that can be done also through competition law, but probably the redistribution of the maximized welfare is not the primary concern of competition law. So I was thinking of um, enlarging the welfare pie as much as possible with the tools of competition law without regard to whether it is consumer welfare or uh, the pro producer's welfare. Um, so one welfare function uh, encompassing all. And then uh, with taxation or with other policy instruments at hand, the redistribution of that uh, enlarged pie may uh, take place. In that discussion, I've uh, visited the uh, topic uh, that was pretty um, hot back in the day 22 years ago, and it isn't hot again now, whether um, fighting inflation could be uh, a goal for competition law, and my answer was no. Whether um, it could be a goal for competition law that you protect small businesses, and the answer was no, and many others. So I, I had a Puritan view of, um, you know, we only have one arrow, and with that arrow, we can hit only one target. Um, that target is economic efficiency that we hit. Um, the arrow is uh, fostering the process of competition. And when we hit uh, economic efficiency, enhancing ef economic efficiency, uh, then uh, we have reason to believe that this is going to, um, to maximize welfare. Uh, whether um, we want it to be consumer welfare uh, categorically is um, a different debate. Um, should we be asking about whether the efficiencies gained, for example, in a merger is going to uh, assist with um, the, uh, the price, um, it, whether it, the prices are going to drop or not, should we ask that question? Or should we say, even if it's only cost savings that might be recouped by the manufacturer, that's still good. Uh, these are other policy questions I had left uh, aside uh, back in the day. Then came in sustainability uh, discussions. Some people expected that I would say, because I was so Puritan about it, 
uh, I would say sustainability has nothing to do with competition law. Um, and it's a, an honorable and, and most important goal. But then again, competition law is not equipped to deal with this. So as I'm excluding things like uh, uh, it, you know, the fight with inflation and all that, uh, I'm not seeing sustainability as a goal of competition law either. But, but I did not take that route because by that time it was clear that there can be no welfare function without the sustainability part of things anyway. Um, so that has to be integrated uh, in the goals of competition law. Um, but in um, my debates, and this is my last sentence on this particular topic for this point, um, I, I took the view that perhaps competition law is not being tasked with uh, sustainability goals as frequently as we think it is. And much of the debate is theoretical and businesses are rarely asking for help in uh, the competition law sense. So it is very, uh, in the competition law sense, to be able to comply with sustainability goals. So it is very rare for businesses to actually want to do something great in the sustainability field, but be hampered because of competition law worries. This, this is a, a hot top, uh, topic and uh, debate in very many jurisdictions, but if there is business demand for a leniency at the competition law side, to be able to comply with sustainability goals is a whole separate question. And the answer, I think, is that businesses are uh, are more frequently using it as an excuse uh, to not do their homework at the sustainability side. Thank you very much, Gunanj. For, for, it, it's always nice to, to, to have a conversation with a person who, who doesn't start with it depends um, and for, for very well positioned uh, vision. Uh, Anna, what, what, how do you see the goals of competition law and 102? My answer is going to be much shorter and much simpler. Um, my view is that the goal of competition law is to protect competition in the market, no more, no less. Thank you very much, Anna. Maximiliano. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Oles, uh, Golenc, and, uh, and Anna. I, I would have started by saying, I'll be short, but I think it's going to be difficult to beat Anna here. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> nonetheless, I'll try to be uh, reasonably short as well. Uh, from my personal side, I believe that the goal of uh, uh, competition law enforcement, and 102 in particular, is uh, essentially consumer welfare. I've started speaking about consumer well being uh, lately because consumer welfare, I think, is a very charged term. Uh, and I do not want to enter into the discussion of uh, what they consider to be consumer welfare in the US in particular. So I prefer to speak about consumer well-being. I don't think that uh, we're talking about a drastically different thing, at least compared to the use of consumer welfare we have in Europe. Uh, and I think two caveats are important though here. The first one is that uh, it may be very difficult uh, for an enforcer to show that a certain practice uh, has harmed consumers specifically. Uh, and that is why I think it's important that we make use of proxies. Uh, and here I link to what uh, Anna said, and I think, by proxies, I mean that sometimes you may have to, uh, you can, for example, show that the conduct harms a competitive structure or competitive process, uh, and that to me uh, is enough to show that the conduct uh, isn't a competitive because we tend to use the presumption that uh, what harms competition will also harm uh, consumers. Uh, and I think that's the first caveat. Um, and the second caveat is, of course, that while I do believe that uh, uh, the objective of Article 102 enforcement is indeed to protect consumer well-being, I also consider that in the process of doing so, uh, Article 102 can protect uh, a number of other uh, goals. I can uh, manage to achieve some of the other goals, such as, for example, the, uh, the reference from the uh, general court uh, in the Android judgment uh, uh, to preserve in plurality uh, in a democratic society. So the fact that the ultimate objective is uh, consumer well-being doesn't mean that on the way to get there, you cannot manage to protect uh, and achieve uh, other objectives. I am grateful that you you gave this um, um, expansive response because if you had kept it as succinct as Anna, then I was going to feel terrible about my uh, my my intervention. So at least uh, yeah, now I'm uh, a, a bit more balanced. <laughs> but I also admire this 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 kind of deja vu moment where, uh, like say, twenty years ago, people would say, "My, I, I think that the goals are of competition." But because competition is incarnated in consumer welfare, we have to look yeah. at it through the prism of consumer welfare. Now we see the opposite. I think that the goal is consumer welfare, but because it's competitive, we can see it through through competitive structure. We have to, very very elegant, Mr. Milano. 
let, let us move to the same. We change rotation so that we don't let the same people start and finish. And I propose this 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 round we start with with you, Anna. But please don't be that succinct as as you've been with the previous one. And obviously, we see that the world is changing with this kind of kaleidoscopic and you know sprinter speed, and so many factors are being influenced in all of us, including competition policy. And some people say, of course, these factors are relevant, but let us have this kind of ex ante new competition tool or whatever we can call it, and do all this regulatory experimentalism, leaving the established, mature jurisprudential, jurisprudentially and economically uh, prudent and um, uh, well refined area of export competition law to it kind of base uh, with and try to to do this kind of sand, regulatory sandbox elsewhere and then maybe later we will we will see what works and what doesn't others say that we have to that dma is only kind of a, a symbol of the broader trend and we have to uh, you know we cannot pour all uh, new wine in old bottles all this stuff so where would you be with these two polarities obviously these are two extremes and nobody would do it in purified form but um, so you're talking about an ideological spectrum, about the ideological left and the ideological right. And my thoughts on that are that I'm very wary of ideology um, guiding decision making in everyday life and in competition law enforcement. And so I, I, I do not place myself on this ideological spectrum. If we take the view, as I do, that the goal of competition law is to protect competition, then I'm in favor of intervening if the evidence suggests that there is an appreciable restriction of competition. Now, if you want me to commit myself to values guiding that I would like to see um, guiding competition law enforcement and also the design of rules, um, I would say that there are three values and three objectives that I consider important. One is minimizing error cost. Number two is minimizing enforcement cost. And number three is maximizing legal certainty in the sense of predictability. And I don't think that any one of these values is more important than the other two. I think we need to strike a sense of balance. And I think that in my view, is something that the current reform is about, recalibrating um, this balance. Thank you, Anna. Max, what would, what, what would be your view? I'm also quite skeptical when one talks about ideology, uh, especially when applied to competition enforcement. I must say I like very much uh, Anne's three values. Uh, I think I may do some further thinking myself about it. And uh, if you don't mind, I may get in touch with you because I find it very appealing as an intellectual uh, uh, framework, uh, but from from my side, would I? So let, let's do one. Let's take one step back. So, uh, if you look at in broad terms what has happened in the past uh, 20, 25 years in the competition law world, I think uh, the first thing which one cannot reasonably deny is the fact that has been deny has been that uh, uh, there has been a big uh, success in terms of what competition law has uh, brought to society. So we see that competition law enforcers, the Commission, but also uh, member state level in Europe, uh, we see that competition authorities have spotted certain issues which have then been uh, brought to the center of the uh, uh, debate uh, and have become very often the subject of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, sector specific regulatory frameworks. And this in itself is a big success. Uh, on the other hand, you also see that in other cases we have uh, we, but I, 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 when I say we, I don't mean necessarily the European Commission, but the competition law enforcers community, uh, we have managed to intervene uh, and spot certain anti-competitive conduct, which uh, we found to be particularly problematic uh, to impose deterrent fines uh, and to try and remedy uh, this kind of conduct. So in broad terms, uh, as I said, I think it has been a big success. Now you see these uh, two calls uh, on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, there's, there's more regulation, uh, don't pollute competition or enforcement, uh, try and uh, uh, solve by means of example regulation what is not pure uh, competition uh, concern. And on the other hand, let's make sure that uh, uh, competition enforcers have uh, all the tools that they need. Let's put in a new competition tool like of instruments. Uh, let's uh, envisage a big reform of uh, uh, competition law. Uh, and indeed, I think that these two positions belong to two different fronts somehow. Uh, from my personal point of view, I don't think that any of them is necessarily wrong. Uh, I think uh, it depends really on the kind of issue that we're 
that we're talking about. If you look at the DMA, for example, it's a great example of uh, issues which have been spotted very often by regulators, uh, sorry, by competition enforcement, where indeed uh, an exempt regulation regulatory framework makes sense. Uh, so I do welcome, from my personal view, uh, this development. Uh, on the other hand, you see that there are other issues, uh, for example, when it comes to speed of enforcement, uh, which may uh, require uh, some debate. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, the ongoing evaluation of Regulation 1 is a great forum uh, to do that. Uh, and perhaps that may lead in the future to more radical changes in terms of uh, the way that we know competition enforcement uh, in Europe. Uh, but I would also like to mention that I don't think we should limit ourselves to thinking in terms of uh, legislative uh, uh, proposals, uh, be it in the form of an exempt regulatory framework of, or uh, drastic uh, amendments of the competition framework. Uh, I think there is still a lot that we can do in terms of trying to systematize the case law, trying to clarify the case law, uh, because that in itself can contribute to at least one of the three objectives that Anne referred to, which is legal certainty. Uh, and of course, this brings to the exercise that we're carrying out in the area of Article 102, which I think is equally important uh, in terms of fostering enforcement and making sure that uh, stakeholders have a good understanding of what the law is. Thank you very much, Professor Nardo. And we will, revert, we, will, we will be discussing these issues in detail in the, in the uh, remainder of, of this conversation. But I, I wanted to ask Gnensh, uh, for his views on, on, on this uh, spectrum? I would choose from Anne's list uh, the one that is closest to my heart when it comes to particularly um, regulating unilateral conduct, uh, and that would be maximizing legal certainty. Uh, not that the others aren't valuable or not that other uh, goals and uh, ideologies couldn't be um, uh, written in there, but maximizing legal certainty is particularly important at this point in time because it, it does feel to me that we're alarmingly close to letting go of that legal certainty for the businesses. Um, the, um, the movement of abolition of market definition um, in the uh, enforcement particularly is making it very difficult to, uh, for businesses to understand if they have a, mar uh, a market power at a given point in time or not. Um, so, you know, is it going to be, a, to, to use a football analogy, is it going to be a penalty if I were to do this, uh, or is it going to be uh, an aggressive competition uh, move? That's, uh, that's puzzling for the businesses. There are new concepts that are being introduced to competition law, uh, like self-preferencing, tipping, what have you. I'm not against the ideas of these, but while competition law is amorphing very quickly uh, and is therefore testing businesses with new uh, ideas, there is a, a parallel movement of seeing competition law in and of itself insufficient, thereby pushing for ex ante regulation. Um, so everything around the businesses uh, is changing all at the same time. Um, this uh, means that we're becoming more prone to false positives in the, especially in the unilateral conduct enforcement cases. Um, and false positives mean big is bad, basically. Uh, it's, it's a wrong uh, kind of enforcement if it is a, an enforcement of false uh, positive. Um, in that, um, the effects-based approach to Article 102 that is now uh, endorsed by courts more and more is a uh, uh, breath of fresh air, uh, but obviously one shouldn't overdo uh, the effects-based approach. Um, in Paris, uh, at the Concurrence, we were discussing this recently, and I was taking the view that potential effects are obviously also uh, a uh, sufficient showing of um, why there could be an Article 102 case. So um, no one charges the enforcers with the duty to show actual effects in each such case. But if you divorce yourself both from the effects and from the market definition, um, and basically it all comes down to a hunch, then it is terribly difficult for businesses to, to understand what kind of conduct is going to uh, lead to a violation of competition law. And that's going to discard with uh, legal certainty, which in turn is going to cripple a lot of the big uh, entities. And uh, while there is reason to suspect that um, entities with market power are uh, more prone to uh, violating competition laws with unilateral conduct, fine. Um, there is also reason to believe that that scale may bring in certain uh, certain efficiencies 
that will push for dynamic efficiencies, particularly because you need that kind of a scale for um, um, new uh, products, some of the new products at least, to be introduced into the market. So there is a virtue of keeping the incumbents vibrant without chopping them down. Uh, and if the, the legal uncertainty is so high that they feel crippled and, and their superior choice is to not do anything, uh, then you have lost on that uh, on that ultimate goal of competition law. Thank you, thank you, Gunanj. I, I wanted to ask a, a, a quick follow up question um, in, in post Denmark Denmark two. Uh, I think it was in submission of uh, Association of European Competition Lawyers to to the consultation. Um, they, they stressed that Advocate General Cocot emphasized the difference between actual and potential effect. And when talking about rebates, uh, it is necessary, but also sufficient that the rebates in question can produce an exclusion effect, the capability of producing effect. So can you highlight what precisely you mean by actual potential effect? So um, potential effects, um, recognition of potential effects as the showing of effects in the Article 102 field, in my mind, um, uh, means that a hypothetical showing of a capability uh, is also enough to find your case. Uh, whereas if you're asking for actual effects, then it is going to be an, an actual empirical evidence of uh, harm to competition uh, that is demonstrated already. Um, the latter will mean that we are interfering too late uh, and also uh, that enforcers will have to wait in instances where they can uh, reasonably presume uh, that there is um, a wrongdoing in the marketplace um, and they, they can't timely interfere. So uh, I think uh, uh, potentially, and, and it is when you read the uh, decisions of the courts in different cases that talk about uh, there having to be a, an effects-based showing, it is consistent with the letter uh, of the law or, or the way the decisions are written as well. There's nothing in those decisions that, that excludes uh, potential effects. I think Anne wanted to uh, say something about, about this, if I saw correctly. Um, yeah, no, my, my thought was about, um, about um, legal certainty, but I think the language that was used in Post-Denmark 2 was that mm. the court said, not hypothetical, not actual, but likely, right? Yeah. Yeah. Likelihood is what was meant by capability yeah. or capacity to restrict. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. if I can jump in a second here, because we looked at this quite in detail and we're still looking at it, and there is a, a long footnote in the <laughs> in the policy brief uh, uh, promoting a, a, a dynamic uh, and workable effect-based approach. Uh, uh, and our conclusion is that, in fact, the court uh, uses different terms, uh, which all end up having the same term, which is a sort of middle ground, uh, as Anne said, between, on the one hand, hypothetical, and the other hand, actual, uh, whether they call it likely, uh, potential, uh, capable effects or the like, that's pretty much the same thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm quite reassured to, to hear that there is consensus on this point that uh, it is uh, uh, sufficient for a competition authority to show uh, potential effects, because indeed, I would be very worried if uh, uh, we were to start to, to talk about actual effects uh, as uh, something that has to no. be shown. But, I, if I can reassure a second, uh, Gunnar, because I think indeed a lot of what he's saying comes a bit again from the US debate. I don't think that at European Commission level, uh, anyone is thinking about uh, getting rid of market definition. If anything, we have a new market definition notice, which is uh, being worked uh, at the moment. Uh, and nobody's thinking about getting rid of an effects analysis. Uh, it's the question is, and I think it's going to come later, how you do effects. Uh, but uh, uh, there is clearly no intention of, of uh, uh, getting rid of that important step in analysis. Though in, mm. in the in the literature, this has been mentioned in in, in even in European by respectful academics yeah. and respectful journals. But that's different. Yeah, we have this luxury to hypothesize, philosophize, and look in the, the constellation of stars and moon. Let us now continue with you, Matt, uh, with, with the third round and look straight to the to to, to the reform proposed reform, and you are in this kind of uh, avant-garde, you are in the intellectual lead of this, uh, administrative lead as well, uh, of, of, of this uh, process. Can you please summarize to us, or let us start with you to, to, to summarize in the, the key ideas, motivation, propositions? Yes, absolutely, with, with pleasure. So let's let's start indeed where 
uh, where this intellectual uh, debate and reflection started from, which is the beginning of the 2000s, where the Commission started this uh, uh, debate and reflection on how to make sure they would have a more prominent role for an effect-based assessment uh, and analysis uh, uh, in abuse of dominance cases. At the time, there was a perception that merger control had gone a little bit further in terms of uh, uh, the importance of economic thinking, I wouldn't say necessarily economic analysis, but economic thinking, the importance of theory of, of arm uh, when it comes to assessing mergers, uh, and that there was a sort of a disconnect, perceived disconnect at least, as to how we're doing things in Europe and how uh, unilateral conduct was assessed in other parts of the world, and again, in particular in the, in the US. So this process started, uh, that led, of course, to the uh, adoption by the European Commission on the guidance uh, of the guidance on enforcement priorities, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, prior to that we didn't have uh, an effects-based uh, uh, approach uh, in Article 102 cases. I would rather say that the emphasis might have been different, uh, but I think that even before there was uh, certainly uh, an attempt to introduce an effects-based rationale uh, in our intervention. I think that some academics like uh, Giorgio Monti have been expressing this uh, uh, very clearly. So what happened uh, afterwards? Uh, if we move uh, to Luxembourg, we see that the, uh, the developments in the case law uh, of the General Court and the Court of Justice have been quite clear. Uh, nowadays, we clearly have case law which is grounded uh, on an effect-based uh, uh, effect principles and on an effect-based rationale uh, for intervention. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, very good, I think, because indeed uh, it helps us focusing our resources for intervention. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't uh, really address the key question here, which is uh, what do we mean by a fact-based uh, approach? Uh, because, of course, you see that different judgments may adopt a slightly different position on this. Uh, there are certainly uh, some trends, uh, some uh, uh, parts of the case law which are not uh, implying by effect based approach the same thing that the guidance paper uh, used to say. Uh, and ourselves, in our experience in the past 15 years, we have uh, perhaps changed a little bit of mind in terms of uh, what is necessary to show uh, in certain cases, also keeping in mind the need to have uh, an effective uh, enforcement. So we want to get it right for sure, but we also want to make sure that we intervene uh, in a situation where we don't have already a dead body or even more than one dead body uh, in the room. So all of this is background uh, to the exercise that we have uh, uh, that we have launched. Uh, this was, uh, uh, of course, launched in March this year, where we have at the same time issued uh, a communication which amended uh, certain specific parts, uh, important but still uh, specific parts of the guidance on enforcement priorities, uh, while at the time we have launched this process uh, of drafting uh, proper guidelines uh, on exclusionary uh, abuses. Now, one thing which I think uh, is important to keep in mind is that this exercise is going to be essentially about reflecting the Commission's interpretation uh, on the law. Uh, at the same time, we're going to try to keep in mind what we've learned uh, in the past 15 years uh, of enforcement. And one of the things in particular which we've learned, uh, as I said, is the fact that uh, uh, while we want to get it right, uh, we want to make sure that we don't uh, end up in a situation where we have false uh, positives. We also want to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where proving an infringement is so cumbersome that de facto we end up in a world where we're going to have a lot of false negatives, where either because we don't have the resources, we don't investigate, or where we try to prove uh, effects, for example, but we realize that the burden is so high that it becomes virtually impossible to do so. And because of that, uh, we're trying to promote this notion of workable and dynamic effects-based approach. Uh, which is a way to say uh, effect based is a good thing uh, in the one or two words, but we have to make sure that we keep the standard for intervention at a level which is reasonable and which allows for a meaningful use of Article 102. And I'll stop here. I think there's a lot of things, other things that I could say, but I, I'll stop here because I'm curious to see what, uh, what Anne and, and Gonanch have to say about this. And we th thank you, Max. And, and we want to go on. You, you mentioned this conference in, in, in Paris by concurrence. And you mentioned there, Ganesh, about false, your concern about false positive. I imagine it must be one of the reasons of, of your more cautious approach to, 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 to this project. So, uh, actually, I do find a, a difference between hypothetical and likely. Um, I think Anne did too, uh, if I uh, understood her correctly. Um, and the main difference is if you keep it, if you keep uh, the potential effects at the level of hypothetical, it's going to become an analysis of your economist against my account, economist, basically. Uh, and I'm not disrespecting economists, um, but uh, the economists um, can also slap the data 
in a given way and and come up with a perspective that shows effect or the lack thereof at a hypothetical level. But the likelihood of something uh, is a different threshold that they will have to uh, uh, jump through. And if we were to ask for a likelihood of uh, effect, uh, then it is closer to an almost empirical finding, and it is more um, justifying an interference and why an interference is happening, because something is imminent. Um, I therefore um, find it A-OK -okay that um, in instances where there's a likely, um, uh, likely um, uh, effect uh, on, uh, on competition, then we interfere. But if it is purely hypothetical, uh, then uh, we hold our horses. Uh, that's my understanding of the decisions of the courts uh, up until this point uh, as well. And that does give me security in terms of um, the legal certainty uh, goals uh, in mind, because if uh, a proper demonstration of likelihood of uh, effects um, uh, are, are uh, done, are undertaken, um, then there's very little to argue as to why uh, uh, an interference is happening. And it is highly unlikely that uh, uh, this would take us to a big as bad uh, type of a point or, or false positives. And let me give an opportunity to, to, to Anna and, and, and Max to comment on this. I think it's, a, it's an important issue if, if, you, if you want at this point. Um, on the issue of likelihood, um, yeah, well, it... All of this really brings me back to my to my, my my three goals that I would like to see in sensible Article 102 rules, namely, you know, minimizing error cost, minimizing enforcement costs, but also maximizing legal certainty. And I think that when the European Commission introduced the more economic approach to EU competition law starting, I think in the late 1990s, starting with Article 101, moving on to merger control and then tackling the last frontier of Article 102, which was the most difficult um, of the three pillars, the focus was very much on trying to ensure more accuracy and to minimize error cost. And this was done by introducing more effects-based analysis and more economics. And I think that this move has gone somewhat, has come somewhat at the cost of the other two points, right? If you're going to invest, if you're going to commit to carrying out in-depth economic state-of-the-art analysis of every single case and of the effects before prohibiting conduct, this is going to increase enforcement co cost. And that's, I think, something that I heard Max say. And unless you increase the budget of the enforcement agency, this is going to result in less enforcement, right? And this not only means that fewer cases are going to be tackled, but I think it also has an effect on deterrence, right? If companies know that the enforcement agency is less likely to intervene because they can't afford to, um, this is going to influence um, their decision making. And also um, legal certainty. And I think reading between the lines, because the communication itself is quite vague, it just says we're going to codify the case law and we're going to codify um, evolving positions. We don't really know where this reform is going yet, but reading between the lines, my impression is that the Commission is trying to recalibrate the balance and, you know, more effective enforcement and more legal certainty and more predictability. Um, so in terms of enforcement cost, I, I once looked at the figures um, in 2016 for, for a book um, on the more economic approach to EU antitrust law. And if, if I remember correctly, um, one factor that would, you know, imperfectly reflect um, the increased enforcement cost, but you know, it is a first factor, is is the decision length. And I, if I remember correctly, I found that the length of decisions pre more economic approach to Article One Hundred Two and post more economic approach um, increased by 20, 20 fold, and that's you know that's that that's quite a lot. Um, and so I think this is a very valuable opportunity to rethink um, whether this effects-based approach may have overshot the mark to some degree. And I also think it's a very valuable opportunity to replace these very, in my view, unfortunate 
this unfortunate guidance on enforcement priorities um, with proper interpretative guidelines. Um, I think, again, that would increase legal certainty. So I think this is, it's a great opportunity. It's an important project. Um, and I, I, I really welcome it. Thank you, Anna. Max? OK, so a couple of comments. First, starting with, uh, with Glonensch uh, on the hypothetical point. I think the case law is clear, uh, but also Qualcomm more recently. Hypothetical effects is not enough. So it's clear to us that the capability to, to arm competition it means something more. Uh, it means that you have to look at the specific circumstances of a case. You don't have to go as far as showing actual effects, but uh, but it's certainly not enough to have a hypothetical effects. On Anne's point, uh, I think that indeed uh, your understanding is correct. There is a, a little bit of recalibration, uh, so to say, at stake, uh, and you can see it from the, the, the amendments uh, that we have decided to uh, implement in the guidance on enforcement priorities. Uh, a lot of it, I think, is not much what was written in the guidance paper, but the way that the guidance paper was interpreted uh, by some uh, in particular. Uh, and the role of the efficient competitor test is uh, one of the typical examples. We're going to talk more uh, about this later on, but let's say that uh, uh, it was quite prominent in the guidance uh, paper and uh, stakeholders out there uh, had a tendency to, uh, at least they interpreted it in such a way that made it even more prominent. Uh, so we thought that there was a, a need to clarify a certain specific uh, concept about the use of that test, uh, which, as I said, we're going to see later on. Uh, but more in general, uh, indeed, uh, while we are going to uh, stick to the case law, uh, we want this document to be guidelines. Uh, we don't want to produce another guidance paper uh, because we think that the case law has evolved sufficiently. Now we have a very large number of judgments. So we have a body of case law which allows us uh, to do this exercise. So why we want to make sure that uh, uh, this uh, uh, is a proper guidelines document. At the same time, uh, we want to make sure that you use the learnings uh, of the past 20 years of enforcement uh, to inform uh, this approach and this process. And uh, uh, the idea uh, is uh, to come up with a, a document that is going to be for public consultation at some point next year. And I'm very much, uh, I'm very much looking forward to hear uh, the views of stakeholders and see if we managed uh, in this process. But of course, there are challenges. And we have uh, two uh, really impactful stakeholders who, 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 who can share their views. And maybe we can also revert to, to potential shortcomings and pitfalls. And this round, we'll start with, with you, Um, Sorry, pitfalls about what? about the, 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 the whole this endeavor of the reform. Right. Um, I, so I think we're in a point of transition at the moment um, in the sense that there is a, a sense with uh, both regulators and even the big incumbent companies that things are not going to be handled through you know, Oscar Bronner's of the world. Um, so you will you will need a new set of tools, um, and the pitfall is under the banner of coming up with a new set of tools. Um, will we be chopping up um, um, any uh, and all conduct of um, entities uh, that have market power, um, and are we going to be suspicious of? Um, all kinds of new approaches, and uh, will we be asking um, questions um, uh, in a leading way, if you will, while enforcing? Or will we maintain our um, level-headed approach, and will we maintain our objectivity in evaluating new forms of doing business and new markets being formed? Um, the pitfall always in this field, especially in 102 field, is um, presuming to know too much or presuming too much. Um, so to be able to keep away from presumptions, we will need to do more homework on facts and on um, on uh, um, uh, economic uh, data available. This is also happening, I, I don't mean to hijack the conversation into a topic dear to my heart, but I asked for your permission to draw some inferences from there as well. Uh, this is also happening in the uh, merger control field uh, in innovation theory theories of harm, and that's very interesting to me. Uh, the reason why I'm invoking that at this point in time is it shows that um, we are actually with a tendency of scaremongering quite a bit, and uh, we do claim to read into the future uh, quite a bit. Um, 
and and that sometimes leads to certain uh, bits of enforcement uh, that are very difficult for entities to predict. Um, and that lack of ability to predict obviously is hitting the, the legal uh, certainty climate that we have been discussing. The reason why I'm talking about the uh, the innovation theories of harm in merger control is because um, we are always very quick to flag uh, concerns with certain tools, but when the same tools are being used as defenses by the uh, by the parties trying to merge, then suddenly we label them, tag them as incalculable, speculative, what have you. This um, very pitfall is also uh, to some extent available in uh, in the Article 102 sphere. So when entities are trying to put forward uh, a case of why they're undertaking a certain practice, there is uh, very frequently a presumption uh, that they must be doing this with exclusionary intent. Um, whereas uh, in some instances, it is a nascent practice uh, that has just not proven itself in the marketplace as um, one that has its own uh, virtues. And just that lack of virtues at that point in time is already making the enforcers jump, uh, take a leap, a leap of faith and jump into the conclusion of uh, uh, there being an exclusionary intent. What I'm trying to say, and this is my last sentence on this uh, particular topic, is that uh, exclusionary intent should be demonstrated in and of itself independently by the enforcer rather than uh, there being a reading of an exclusionary intent because the enforcer is unable to come up with a plausible theory as to why the company is behaving in a certain way. Thank you very much, Anna. Hmm. Well, it's quite hard to talk about, you know, the potential pitfalls of the reform because we don't yet know what the result of this reform is going to be. So it's a very early stage and um, this is very speculative. Um, so my impression you know is that the commission is trying to rein in some of the excesses of the current approach of the current effects and welfare-based approach not by abandoning um you know the effects-based approach and returning to formal presumptions such as you know we used to have tying used to be presumed illegal um exclusivity agreements used to be presumed illegal so my understanding is that that is not um the intention i think maybe the intention is to somewhat tweak the evidentiary um, standard of proof. Um, one potential pitfall that I see is that the European Court of Justice may not play ball. So, um, I mean, one of the reasons we ended up with this um, guidance on enforcement priorities in 2009 instead of interpretative guidelines is that the more economic approach, this welfare and effects-based approach to Article 102 was not compatible with the case law. Right, the court did adhere at the time to very strong presumptions, and it was not on board with a purely welfare-based approach. And uh, this has changed. I think if we look at recent cases, um, Unilever Italia and Intel and um, Enel, the court has taken the welfare-based approach and the effects-based approach and has run with it. Um, sometimes even going further than the, than the European Commission intended in its enforcement priority. So we find ourselves in the somewhat paradoxical situation that if the Commission now tries to rein in some of the um, current approach, um, the court might not agree, right? So it's a very <laughs> unusual situation. So with 50, 50 years delay, Chicago seems to have arrived in, in Luxembourg. Thank you very much, Anna. And I think, uh, Massimiliano, some colleagues from legal services start calling the term economic formalism. Uh, but how do you see a potential pitfall? Yes, indeed. So I, I think it's both what uh, Gorenc and Anna said is find it very interesting. Just one one comment on, on each before I go to to my own uh, uh, elaboration on on this. Uh, the first point on, on Gorenc, I mean, I I don't think that we are using presumptions to presume including uh, intent or, or intent to foreclose because we don't have to show intent. I mean, we know according to the case law that uh, intent is not uh, required, at least under EU competition law. So I don't think that uh, uh, at the commission level we have ever made use of presumptions to presume uh, intent to foreclose. Uh, and on Anne's point, uh, uh, I, I, I hear you. Um, 
I do believe that uh, the case law of the Court of Justice in particular sets uh, a reasonable threshold in terms of intervention. I think that the interpretation of the uh, of uh, the judges in, Luxem in, Lu in Luxembourg is a, uh, is a reasonable one, what one can mean of a fact-based approach. There have been, from my personal point of view, uh, one instance in particular of a little bit of an extreme uh, uh, interpretation, which is the the Ramboa judgment uh, uh, on Intel uh, of the general court, which we are appealing. Uh, indeed, let's see what happens there. Uh, but by and large, I think that uh, the case law of the Court of Justice uh, and the general court sets uh, an appropriate, uh, uh, the bar at an appropriate level in terms of, uh, of intervention. Now, uh, I don't want to talk about pitfalls. I prefer to talk about challenges. Uh, and I have, uh, I think I have three uh, that come to mind. The first one is uh, uh, the fact of uh, the complexity of the issue, because of course, uh, Article 102 is complex. There is a reason why this has been the last uh, of the Commission instrument, which has moved towards an effects-based uh, uh, approach. Um, and on the other hand, we're very mindful of this uh, complexity, and I'm very happy that we decided to proceed on the, on the basis of this two-steps approach. So first, the amendments to the guidance paper and the call for evidence, which allowed us already to generate a public debate uh, and to collect some feedback from stakeholders, because this feedback is already being helpful at this stage while we are preparing the guidelines. Uh, so this two steps approach, I think, is going to help uh, tackling the complexity of the issues. But of course, uh, let's not hide it. It is a complex uh, topic. Uh, the second challenge is that of uh, the Commission being able to provide uh, sufficiently hands-on guidance. And I think it goes back to the legal certainty point. Uh, we can have, of course, the most uh, appealing intellectual framework in the world. Uh, but uh, I think we would be failing with this uh, endeavor if we were not managing to provide uh, some concrete uh, guidelines uh, uh, to stakeholders uh, and in particular dominant companies as to how they're expected to behave. Uh, so we will try to the extent possible to be as end zone as possible in terms of uh, uh, providing this uh, practical guidance to companies. Uh, and the third uh, challenge, of course, is completeness. Uh, I don't think we're going to manage to enshrine in one document the whole case law on Article 102 uh, since its, except, since, since its uh, inception. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that is necessarily a problem because to the extent that we have a convincing uh, general framework for assessment, that should be enough. Uh, so we are not going and we're not aiming for completeness, uh, but rather for having something which conceptually and practically makes sense. Thank you much. Indeed, Max. Uh, we, we, we have a few other questions. I, I'm aware of time. Uh, you have highlighted most of them, uh, the future of um, uh, effects-based effect -based approach, uh, the role of enforcer's discretion, and new and old formal, the emergence of new formalism, so to say. I propose we, we, we mention them if you, if you think it's really necessary in, in, in trying to elaborate other questions, because we have we still have a few other issues to discuss. So I propose we move to a sufficient competitor test, which is another kind of play of semantics and the, the, the linguistics, so to say. Uh, Anna, let's start, uh, let's start with you this, this, this round, please. Hmm. So I'm not an economist, and so it is really difficult for me to pronounce myself on the validity of the test itself. I think a little knowledge is dangerous knowledge. <laughs> Um, that being said, from my perspective as a lawyer, um, I find Advocate General Cocotte's warning in Post Denmark too that there are situations in which even a less effective or a less eff efficient competitor is better than no competitor at all, I'm convincing. And the second point I'd like to make is that the Intel case really gives me pause for thought. <laughs> So this shouldn't have happened, right? Intel decision from 2009 is the first commission decision in which the commission in substance, if not in form, applied the principles of the guidance paper and did what it think, the thought um, is a state of the art as efficient competitor test. And you know the saga, right? So we've got a decision from 2009. It goes to the general court. It goes to the court of justice. It goes back to the general court. Um, who've, and the judges uh, found that the as efficient competitor test was not up to scratch. It's now gone back to the European Court of Justice. 23 years after the rebates were granted, we're still litigating this in court. And um, that makes me wonder, is it really worth it, right? Um, 
that's that's a thought that I have on the as efficient um, competitor test. This was not supposed to happen, right? This was supposed to ensure the most accurate, <laughs> airtight um, assessment of, of of the effects um, on competition and consumer welfare. So, you know, is it really worth it? That is what I take away from the Intel saga. Thank you very much, Anna. Max, now it's your turn. Yes, and I <laughs> I think Anne's remarks are a good introduction to what I'm about to say. Uh, so th the test in itself is uh, appealing from an intellectual point of view. Uh, that is clear, and that is the reason why uh, it ended up in the guidance on enforcement priorities. Now, I should distinguish that from the use that uh, has been made of the test. Um, because if one reads, well, even the original guidance on enforcement priorities, uh, you see that there is no real indication there that we would have used it for exclusivity type of rebates. There is a whole discussion as to whether other type of re other retroactive rebates, for example, uh, and uh, of course in predation, in margin squeeze, uh, all of that is there, but there is no real indication that we would have uh, used the test in exclusivity uh, conduct. So uh, this was done in Intel, uh, indeed, uh, and I do not want to comment on where we ended up. Uh, it was done in uh, Google Android as well, uh, again, in the case of uh, exclusivity type of conduct, uh, and the general court there uh, has not found that the test was carried out uh, as it should have been. Um, so uh, it is clear that the test presents some challenges, uh, which is also what the general court says, it speaks about the inherent challenges uh, of the test. So I think it is our duty in terms of administrative uh, administrability to uh, take one step back and reflect uh, on the fact that even if we're talking about an intellectually appealing framework, uh, in which circumstances will we want to use it? Uh, and in the policy brief uh, that we published uh, last March, we uh, try indeed to uh, come up with a, a sort of categorization of practices between those instances where a test has to be used uh, and we're talking about predation and margin squeeze where the price itself uh, is anti-competitive and there is uh, it's really difficult to imagine a way out uh, without making use of the test. Uh, other instances like exclusivity, and in particular I'm referring to exclusivity because we have used the test in exclusivity cases, uh, and in these cases uh, on the basis of the learnings uh, from our experience we do not think that generally speaking it is uh, uh, useful to make use of the test. Uh, it is not only our experience because in the meantime economists have concluded uh, in the past 15 years that the use of an sufficient competitive test on exclusivity practices can even be misleading. Uh, and because of these reasons, we do not think that at commission level, we want to make use of this test. Uh, different case if the company brings forward the test, in that case, we have to look at it as Unilever says, but generally speaking, we don't want to be the ones using the test. And then other type of conduct, mainly, uh, namely other type of rebates, that's the, where the, the question mark uh, arises, where we think that in some cases it may be helpful to make use of the test. Uh, but I think we're not living anymore in a world where we think that yes, official competitive test is the answer to all problems, uh, because indeed, as uh, Anne's uh, very effectively uh, as Anne very effectively introduced, uh, we have realized that there are some quite significant challenges uh, with the test. Uh, which could end up hampering uh, enforcement if the test is used uh, uh, in a situation where it is not appropriate. Thank you very much, Max. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to take two parts in this. Um, one, uh, just half a step back into this exclusionary intent uh, point, because I do agree that uh, if, if we are confining ourselves into a reading of the recent decisions um, by antitrust authorities, especially those in uh, Europe, um, you don't see a separate effort of uh, demonstrating exclusionary intent uh, because it's not needed. Uh, but uh, if we are uh, also allowed to bring in the processes of these investigations, um, we have the benefit of seeing that a lot of reputable antitrust agencies and also the Commission send a question of why why have you done what is the the objective uh, commercial reasoning for you to engage in this particular strategy if it is not to exclude a competitor those types of questions you receive in uh, the course of investigations and uh, it, it does give more than a hunch 
to the agencies that there is something artificial going on and uh, in the absence of uh, an independent lawful answer to why that uh, practice is engaged in, uh, they are more convinced that they're uh, following a correct lead. There's nothing wrong with any of this, but it does then allow us academically to discuss that um, exclusionary intent reading uh, should not happen uh, too easily. Uh, and when academically that point is put forward, I think um, it, it shouldn't be too easy to say, well, it's not a prong of the analysis anyway. It's not a point of proof that is expected from uh, the uh, agencies, which is in and of itself a true statement. But uh, I think it does help the agencies in convincing themselves as to whether they are engaging in a uh, in a correct um, type of enforcement case uh, throughout the process. So it's a maybe corroborating uh, factor that does not get displayed in um, in the recent decision, and it, do it doesn't uh, turn into a turning point of the case, but it does give more than an inspiration uh, as to how to, uh, to enforce a matter or uh, whether to read other plausible explanations as to why a certain uh, market practice is in place. Now, moving on to the as efficient competitor test, I have only two points that are very close to my heart that I have been broadcasting quite heavily um, about the as efficient competitor test uh, for 102. One, um, I find virtue in protecting the not yet as efficient competitor too. Um, so a competitor that is not yet as efficient as the incumbent could still be putting meaningful uh, pressure on the incumbent. And if we were to be too uh, rigid with uh, the as efficient competitor test, we might be actually losing uh, a source of uh, vibrant energy in the, um, in the marketplace, thinking that particular player is not worthy of uh, protection. Number two is there is something flawed with the as efficient competitor test, there are many things that are flawed with it. Flawed in the sense that it's difficult to administer. It's not flawed as a, as a creature in and of itself, but it's really difficult to, uh, to come up with binding principles that will be applicable um, uh, case by case by case in the same fashion. Um, but one particular flaw of it is that over time, I think um, my co-speakers would also agree that it has led to defense counsel, and I myself, I am being, besides being an academic, I, I am a defense counsel. Um, so from the ranks, I'm, I'm telling this. Defense counsel have started becoming a little uh, too preoccupied with demonstrating the inefficiencies of the excluded entity. So suddenly the file is reeking of all kinds of discussion on how inefficient the uh, entity that is allegedly foreclosed it, uh, was and the wastes of that entity and you know a vomit of facts and and uh, uh, numbers that show to the enforcer that um, uh, this entity was doomed anyway. I don't think that's helpful, and I don't think that should be the deciding point of the exercise, and I don't think that was the intent in coming up with the as efficient competitor test to begin with. So um, that I think is one of the, the side effects, if you will, of having the as efficient competitor test um, uh, the way it is preserved today. I don't know if um, Max would uh, agree with this, but uh, I, I say a lot of files are too preoccupied with um, defenses on the inefficiencies uh, of uh, the entity and too little with uh, the you know objective reasoning of engaging in that conduct and whether it has the capability of foreclosing anyway and all that. So too much is turning around um, the question of whether the excluded entity or the entity that is threatened, threatened with exclusion was efficient to begin with anyway. Yes, if I may jump in actually, I think that uh, Gonak's intervention uh, outlines in a very clear manner what are the 
the two challenges, if you want. One is about lawyers and the other one is about economists. The one which is about lawyers is that the test has never been about actual competitors, which have been for yeah. The test has always been about hypothetical as efficient yeah. competitors. Then lawyers come in and say, oh, no, actually, you have to look at the efficiency of the competitors, which have been excluded. And the commission or whatever agency has to show that the competitors, which are actually been excluded, are as efficient. The idea has never been that. Yeah. Uh, and this is really a misuse of the uh, of the uh, of the framework. And the 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 economic issue instead is the fact that uh, uh, as any uh, good economic test, you can take two economists and they can tell you yeah. completely different things about the test. And you know uh, you end up with a judgment like the general course uh, judgment in Intel, saying that it is enough to cast doubt on the uh, as efficient competitive test to invalidate the commission decision. I really struggle to understand how one can use uh, such a test in a robust and convincing way to prove illegality of a conduct uh, if it is enough to cast doubt uh, to invalidate the whole assessment. Uh, we, in competition law, we don't operate in the world of uh, uh, clear-cut truth. <laughs> we operate with proxies. Uh, we operate uh, uh, with uh, observable behavior, uh, multi-causal events, and the like. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, and I don't think that uh, we can make use of a test uh, uh, which, at least uh, as uh, uh, a synonymous of uh, uh, the very way to prove illegality, uh, which has these kind of limitations. Okay, so let us now uh, approach into the end. Uh, I wanted to ask, obviously, we know that the, the very enforcement culture is changing very quickly. We see it with DMA most prominently, but obviously, we are talking about the same institution and the processes impacting or shaping the DMA are objective and they also transferable to, to, to exposed uh, reality, to change in reality. Do you see, do you envisage some significant recalibration of the very role of enforcement and enforcers, or we are pretty much looking at some incremental micro improvements or evolution? Uh, I propose we start th this time with you, with you Mark. Yes, thanks a lot. So I, I, I think that, as I said at the beginning, the DMA was a, a very important development, uh, and it made sense. Uh, and I think that in that kind of context, uh, to have sort of a box ticking approach where you list the conduct uh, and uh, uh, you uh, define the type of conduct that you don't want to see in the market, uh, and that's the end of the story without looking at efficiencies or other factors, I think it's just very well justified in that specific uh, uh, case. Uh, I do not think that we can import that kind of approach uh, within competition law and uh, certainly within Article 102, uh, because the tool has uh, a need to have uh, incorporated in itself a sort of a flexibility to address uh, uh, different type of issues, uh, and we need to be able to look uh, uh, at the whole, uh, at all the circumstances, the legal and economic uh, circumstances, uh, as uh, 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 stated by the case law. What I think is useful, uh, though, is uh, to make use of uh, what we call as proxies. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, if you look at, for example, rebates, uh, the case law, uh, and the inter case law in particular, makes very clear that you have to look at a certain uh, at a number of, uh, of parameters and factors. You have to look at coverage. You have to look uh, at the conditions of the rebates, in particular, whether they are retroactive uh, or not. You have to look at the duration of the rebates, so longer is worse than short. You have to look at the possible existence of intent, and so on and so forth. Why do you have to look at this? Not because you have to show actual effects, uh, as we we're discussing uh, at the beginning, uh, but rather because uh, put together, these are proxies for the existence of anti-competitive effects. So if you satisfy enough uh, of these parameters, and when you look at all of them together, of course, against the background of the theory of ARM, then you can conclude with reasonable confidence that you have anti-competitive effects. So no to a tick boxing exercise, yes to the meaningful use of proxies uh, as part of the competitive assessment. Thank you very much, Mark. Good end. I agree with that. So um, of course, presumptions are uh, not great friends of um, finding truth and actual reality, because in every presumption, there's going to be a uh, margin of error. But at the same time, if we were to turn the entire exercise into having to find direct links um, and uh, having to demonstrate uh, the actual existence of something without relying on any proxies, then uh, this is going to make enforcement uh, untimely, late, and after the event. 
um, and the market dynamics will have changed quite dramatically. Uh, the uh, one, of, one of the issues with Article 102 type enforcement is that you're already policing in a field where um, you're uh, engaging in an uphill battle of enforcement because um, you know there's there's uh, enough reason to believe that um, the the game field may have tilted already and what you're doing is just uh, uh, bringing some balance to it with with a teaspoon. And if if that teaspoon is is also taken away uh, on account of um, there being too many proxies, what have you, uh, by the time uh, you come up with your case, uh, the playing field will will be uh, tilted and tipped even further. Uh, that I understand. But at the same time, uh, of course, we have to always um, uh, make sure that these worries of tipping and these worries of timeliness, do not lead to too many leaps of faith. And um, what we are um, uh, using as ingredient in our cases are proxies, and they are not um, actual, um, you know, presumptions and futuristic scaremongering. Um, the difference between the two will be um, formed through the use of proper economic evidence uh, and uh, proper facts. Um, and reliance on hard evidence, um, maybe not as this positive proof of all of the allegations, but at least having uh, an underpinning of uh, the theories of harm that are being advanced. I'm not saying that this is not being done at the moment, uh, but at the same time, uh, especially in digital markets and especially in uh, Article 102 enforcement in digital markets, uh, there are so many unfamiliar uh, dynamics of these markets and so many ecosystem uh, effects uh, and so many defenses available to uh, the incumbents uh, that uh, sometimes it makes the enforcement agencies impatient. And they they sometimes come at a particular case with the mindset that whatever this incumbent player is saying is to fudge it. So they pierce through too much. And some of the stuff that is thrown at them as defenses is actually things that are, are making that market vulnerable and uh, are worthy of attention. It's unfortunate that uh, there's a whirlwind of, of uh, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, uh, defenses. And uh, I guess there, there's partly the lawyers to be blamed as well because they overplay their hands uh, from time to time, making it difficult for the um, enforcement agencies to sift through uh, what is a make-believe argument and what is a genuine concern. Thank you, Ganesh. Anna. Fundamentally, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I don't think there's any value in importing the DMA approach to, to Article 102. Some of the challenges we've outlined of Article 102 comes from its flexibility, but I think that's also one of its strengths. And so I think, you know, a number of tweaks would be welcome, um, but no fundamental rethinking. That being said, there's one point we haven't touched on, um, one weakness of the current guidance. So it wouldn't be sufficient to make these tweaks and then change the heading um, from guidance to guidelines. Um, the guidance dates from 2008, right? And the economy has changed beyond recognition. And there's nothing on digital platforms in the current um, guidance on enforcement priorities. So we need workable guidelines and guidance on how to assess market power and you know, workable theories of harm for digital um, platform markets and digital ecosystems in particular. So that's that's going to be you know a big, big, <laughs> big challenge, I think. Thank you, Anna. And let, let me pause on this uh, for, for a minute, maybe maybe to, 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 to a question to you, Max, and, and Gunansh, if you want to comment. I, I think some commentators, for example, um, uh, Asimakis Komnenos, uh, mentioned that uh, what was uh, the, the, the legal ground for guidance in early 2000 was uh, Lex Ferenda, whereas now it's Lex Lata, pretty much. What, what is your purely juristic, it's probably a question for all three of you in conjunction with, with, with Anna's uh, uh, latest comment. Is it the case? Is it something, is it just a, a, an intellectual kind of uh, reflection or is it something which can be a real uh, complication in terms of implementing it into guidelines? 
I, I mean, I, I don't want to enter too much uh, intellectual discussions. Of course, Marcus is a very uh, refined lawyer, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, he has reflected on on this. From from my point of view, the situation is quite simple. In 2008, uh, the case law had uh, some holes, let's put it this way, which the guidance paper tried to fill in. Uh, the situation now is very different because uh, the case law has evolved. Uh, we have uh, pretty solid, uh, pretty solid grounds uh, to assess uh, a number of different types of behavior. Uh, if you add to that the commission practice, uh, I think that uh, we cover a lot. Uh, and just to reassure uh, Anne, we are not going just to take the guidance paper and change the title. <laughs> that is not the idea. Otherwise, it would have been uh, much faster uh, as a process, uh, uh, and would already have a draft uh, for consultation out there. No, it's a comprehensive uh, redrafting exercise. Uh, we are doing it all from scratch. Uh, and the idea is precisely to take into account a lot of the uh, of the experience that we gain, especially uh, with the digital cases. Thank you very much, Mr. Milano. Kenneth, do you want to, to, to comment on, on the past? I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, in this case, I we usually close our conversation with asking the guests to, to provide some reflections, uh, recommendations to students, both in terms of uh specific i don't know methodological approach maybe some competences skills which would increase their employability or maybe just a uh, recommendation from 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 your established positions which mistakes they have to are, are most plausible they're the most easy to 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 make and thus most important to avoid this kind of issues which would be more subjective personal and really helpful for for our students so Maybe we start with you, Ganesh, as you didn't comment on the last point. I would, um, I would, uh, I think, say something that I say to my students all the time, which is that um, now that the digital markets have warranted a whole new set of approaches and uh, they have a, a, a body of precedents belonging to those markets, um, sometimes the students make the mistake of thinking, the heritage case law in the United States and also in uh, the EU um, isn't relevant anymore, or that it, uh, as far as digital markets are concerned, and uh, they jump into the digital cases without context. Um, one thing that I would flag for all students of competition law is that without uh, knowing the underpinnings of the the um cases that have brought us here at the uh, unilateral conduct side it is very difficult to contextualize uh what is going on in the digital markets at this point in time it's kind of like trying to engage in complex mathematics uh without knowing the basics of uh the uh mathematical formulae so uh, if you rid yourself of aspen skiings and um, you know, Oscar Bronner's and Microsoft and Hilti, uh, what have you, um, uh, Ladbrokes and Volvo v Vang, you know, we could count forever. It is um, difficult to suddenly move into the sphere of, oh, self-preferencing is a problem. I have read everything to be read on the topic of self-preferencing, uh, and now I know. Um, it, it, I, I would therefore encourage students to see this as a holistic ex exercise, even if uh, they have uh, a um, particular uh, propensity to go into the digital side of things, which is understandable because the new new stuff is happening there. So they have more chances of saying something new. Um, they would need to do the hard work uh, on the other uh, sides of uh, uh, the same type of um, issues that presented themselves in brick and mortar uh, markets back in the day, so that they know the principles well and why certain things evolved. If if an ex exception is being made to matters of standards of proof or uh, or burden of proof, uh, they are able to diagnose it, and they don't think that this is the uh, the starting point of everything and all that. Thank you very much, Anna. How would you recommend? What would you recommend to our students? 
So first of all, I endorse what my predecessor said. I think it's important to know where we're coming from. You can't understand the current debates and the current law without having studied the classics. So don't throw away Bronner. <laughs> Um, my other piece of advice, which build on that, is always go to the original source. So that's something I see my students at the moment. If Google doesn't provide it, they don't go looking for it. So don't don't rely on 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 Twitter and don't rely on summaries. Go to the original source and read it yourself. Um, you'll be surprised by 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 what you find. Thank you, Anna. Massimiliano. And my advice, which goes on top of uh, Gunnar and, uh, and Anne, uh, behind each case and behind each decision, there is a story. Mm. Look at the story. Uh, there's two sides of it, at least. One is the facts, and the facts matter, uh, because if one does not grasp fully the facts, then it's very difficult to understand why the commission or another authority has decided in a certain way. So don't look only at the principles, but go and look at the facts, uh, what happened in that specific case, and also look at the procedure in a case, because that says a lot about what happened. There is, it looks dry, but normally there is all procedural part before the, the, the substantive part of the decision starts, uh, which can be very informative as to what happened exactly in that specific case and why we ended up with a certain situation. So don't uh, underestimate the amount of additional information that one can get by looking at this uh, uh, part of the decision. Thank you very much, Max. Ganesh Gurkhanak, Anna Veet, Massimiliano Kadar, many thanks indeed for your time and for sharing your really remarkable ideas today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.